Welcome to the Yaris Mammal Podcast. This is Chris. And in this episode, I have two interviews that are not really related, only in that they were both speakers at the recent Tech Open Air event here in Berlin. And it's about all that really connects them. Well, maybe maybe this episode is about visions of the future or, or something like that. That's tenuous, though. But anyway, the first interview is with uh, Micah Mika Koch, who's the managing director of Urban X, which is a urban tech startup accelerator backed by BMW and Mini. And uh, actually, I, I sort of went in not really knowing what to expect because I don't really know much about cars, <laughs> but I was a little naive to think that that's all they do. In fact, they actually back quite a lot of interesting companies and projects, and we ended up having quite a good discussion about the future of cities and travel and urbanization, et cetera, et cetera. And then the second interview is with Rachel Ginsberg, where we talk about her project Frankenstein AI, which was uh, an art project where she looked at how we, how we interact with AIs. And she was unfortunately quite sick, but we had just enough time to get a, a short talk in. And it's a very interesting talk about how we can make AIs better. So enjoy. <laughs> Um, to the Suez Canal blockade. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, in the late 1950s, basically, uh, the legend is is that the government asked this really well-known designer and engineer named Sir Alec Sagonis, yeah, um, to help develop a vehicle uh, at a time when gasoline was really limited and all you had were these gas-guzzling land yachts kind of moving around in London. Um, and he literally sat four people down on the floor and then drew a line right alongside of them and said this is going to be the footprint of the vehicle and then developed the transverse engine as a response mm. to that and that whole kind of creative use of space mm. um, I think really emerged as a as a solution to a particular societal problem so if you think about the societal problems that we have around cities again whether it's affordable housing or traffic or energy or waste or what have you it's that same kind of approach to thinking outside the box that we are looking for and with the founders that we work with yeah uh, my name is Micah Koch. It's M-I-C-A-H, and the last name is K-O-T-C-H. Uh, I'm the managing director of Urban X, uh, which is an accelerator for startups reimagining city life, mm -hmm. uh, and I work for uh, Mini. Okay. So we, we kicked off a little bit there talking about um, the origins of the Mini. Uh, and the origins were that it was to reduce fuel consumption, and actually at the same time, I think they're all. There's also the like the oh, I don't know how familiar you are with British car history, but <laughs> it's like things like the Robin Reliant, which was also very small. Um, and then in France, you had things like the two CV and these low-powered engines. And it's actually kind of strange in that, as is often, we we think that something we're doing now is new, when actually it isn't. Um, but probably apart from the the smart car and maybe a couple of others, it's almost like cars have kind of gone back the other way again. In, in my observation, I don't know if that's really true or not, because I don't know much about cars, but and we'll dig into that in a bit more in a minute. Yeah. But is that do you think that is that true or not, or am I just it's just my observation of? I think certainly um, cars have gotten bigger over time. Mm. Um, but I think like the concept of mobility and um, thinking about transportation as you know an interconnected vertical, mm -hmm. um, particularly around cities, like that's changed. And I think the thinking at um, automotive OEMs has changed in terms of um, you know we just make vehicles to thinking you know fully about um, you know transportation mobility as a service. You know you see companies like. Um, Ford integrating with bike share companies and, and you know, we've had this um, phenomenon in the U.S. recently around electric scooters and mm -hmm. Uber is doing vertical mm -hmm. uh, uh, takeoff and, and landing vehicles. So I think that the concept of... I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, the, the Mini brand in particular um, is now starting to think about... Um, it's evolution as uh, a lifestyle brand and and one that is um, really interested in the question of of how do you how do you build a, a better um, urban existence mm -hmm. and and you know ultimately I think if you think about you know the idea of more efficient more enjoyable more livable cities yes mobility is is a big piece of that right but it's it's not the only piece yeah. and so many actually just launched their first living project in shanghai um 
and is now exploring that model all around the world. And that, and, and that kind of fits into the category of beyond the car business models. Yeah. This actually come to that because that's something that interests me a lot. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of factors there, but it's interesting you say Shanghai because this is obviously, um, we have a tendency to think about where we're from, but I've been to Shanghai and um, the places in India and China are the places mm-hmm. you actually have to think most about because the middle, middle class is growing and if the countries with populations that size all want to start living like us... It's often a criticism of saying, well, why shouldn't they be able to when we have? But <laughs> we need to provide some alternatives to make that possible. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, we're in for a lot of mess. Um, yeah, so it's interesting that that's the test ground, I think. Uh, uh, were you involved with that? or? Yeah, yeah. So I'm part of this small team uh, within the company that um, is charged with uh, helping to um, disrupt the the business from the inside before it's completely disrupted from the outside. And what's it like running pilot projects in China? Uh, well, the Mini Living Project um, is taking a, a large former paint factory okay. and then transforming it into a um, into a, a co living uh, environment where there's a real openness to the community um, as a whole, and I think local relationships are probably incredibly yeah. important everywhere. I think even more so in, in China, Definitely. uh, you, Guanxi, yeah. you need those kind of, um, local connections that can help move projects forward. Otherwise um, you get pushed out of your exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. I actually started my career in China. I lived and worked in China in the late 1990s okay. and it's just been, it's been, um, really incredible to see the growth in cities yeah. like Shanghai, where the scale is almost inconceivable. I am coming from a place like New York. Yeah, I have a friend who's lived there for like 15 years. He did Chinese in economics. He went there for his, like, um, what's the word? The, the year when you go and study somewhere else, and he never came back. Mm. Well, he has come back quickly, but <laughs> he married a Chinese woman who runs a Chinese yeah. business. Yeah. He loves it. He's mostly in Beijing. He lived yeah. in Shanghai for a little bit, but he's mostly in Beijing, and he loves it. I can understand. I think he got it at the right time as well. I can really understand that sometimes Europe and the US feel a bit tired. Yeah. And I can understand the um, the attraction, actually. But. Yeah, but it's fascinating to me, like, the lock-in. So, you know, in, in the U.S., at least, we talk a lot about FAMGA, right? Like, you can't get away from fa- Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. Google, and Apple. Yeah. And, and the, but the lock-in that companies like, you know, Tencent um, and Baidu and, and, yeah. and Alibaba have there is really remarkable. Yeah. And then when you couple that with, with government control and the idea of, like, the social credit score. <laughs> Some could say they're somewhat connected. The, the, the private and public <laughs> yes <laughs> anyway <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other topic Let, let's get back to the the disrupting the car business from within I mean this is interesting because you also have noticed one notices this at the moment with the uh, traditional oil producing countries like Dubai for example mm. is investing a lot of money into recognizing that it's not going to last forever right let's do something else before it's too late right um, and it's, it's interesting because many companies in, the, in history have been guilty of not recognizing quick enough and yeah. uh, just carrying on with status quo and yeah. running out. And so it's interesting to see car companies doing the same. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously probably what you're doing is fairly broad, but what are some of the... The, the scopes of projects you're doing. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, let me just say that, um, you know, I think Mini has always prided itself on this very human centric mm-hmm. approach to design. And I think as it looks to become an urban electric mobility brand um, and one that, you know, really embraces this, this future of, of connectivity and electric and shared mm-hmm. vehicles and autonomous vehicles, I think, you know, it will continue to do those things really well. So I don't think the core mobility business goes away. However, um, to your point about um, disruption and changing customer expectations, I I think um, companies need better ways to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And in the case of um, many, they've set up this this accelerator program, UrbanX, um, to work with founders really shoulder to shoulder. Um, to help kind of ask the right questions around the future of cities. And so we work with startups who are innovating around the built environment, real estate, mm-hmm. tech, construction, 
um, mobility and transportation, but also things like energy, waste, food, water technologies, public health and safety, um, infrastructure and the and industrial Internet of Things. So some of those things, some of those categories are going to be strategic for the core brand and what the what the company does really well and will continue to do. But again, as we think about um, projects like Mini Living where you can arguably leverage some of the core strengths in design and manufacturing and engineering and marketing um, to start to be able to work with founders, I think, is arguably one of the best tools that any company can have um, to help prepare them for this very uncertain future. From a business perspective, I mean, what, what does the company get out of this, though? Like, There's some that are more obvious, which we'll come back to, but then... Um, is it the car companies are looking now to become sort of more broad, like someone like General Electric or something, or is there something else at play here? Like I can understand with IoT, it can be interesting to automated cars because it feeds into the data. That's one I can sort of see. Mm-hmm. Reducing energy, I mean, beyond social responsibility goals, I can't see too much business um, advantage or am I being too narrow thinking here? Well, again, so, so there, there are some elements of what we do that are, that are intrinsically connected to the core Mm -hmm. business. So for example, we had a, we have a company uh, called Luna wave, which is 3d printing radar sensors. Um, and uh, incredibly valuable as you think about some of the, mm. the limitations um, of LIDAR and some of the, the traditional limitations around angular resolution for radar companies. Yeah. So they're actually working with, 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 um, with sensor designers and, and, and radar engineers within BMW, within Munich. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, for these other things that are, that are a little bit farther away from the core business, I think the approach is, you know, again, the company recognizes is that it's it's customers experience you know living in cities kind of working in cities etc doesn't right. end okay, okay. when they step out of the vehicle okay, okay. and yeah. so again what are the ways that we can kind of help brighten urban life mm. and I think um, what we try to do is over the course of a five month period really help early stage entrepreneurs with the tools and resources that they need to kind of bring their product to market um, to figure out um, you know what their path to, to traction is how can they how can they work with 100 cities over the next five years? And then ultimately, how can they run a fundraising process, which I think most early stage programs don't really do very well. Mm. Um, it's just kind of like, all right, here's your pitch deck and it's yeah. done a day. And, and of course, luck. broader than mini, I mean, vehicles are also buses and trains and all sorts of other things. It's not just private cars. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I think, in, you know, one can argue that Part of the reason why we have so many problems with cities is today because we've we've looked at a lot of these issues in a very siloed manner, right? Mm-hmm. So we've looked at mass transit very differently than we've you know looked at housing, mm-hmm. and we've looked at energy differently than we've looked at you know vehicle ownership, etc. And again, I think you start to see a lot of convergence in a future where, you know, you have more electric vehicles mm. that are grid tied, just yeah. as a, for example, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. or where, you know, shared ownership principles and yeah. housing, et cetera, is, you know, linked to issues around food sustainability and waste streams and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think we're trying to think about these things a little bit more holistically and recognize that, again, they're really good opportunities. And if, in fact, we can bring that human centric design approach, we can bring the things that we do well with um, communication, marketing, distribution, that there's a real value add there for, for founders. And actually, uh, one other, one other question I'd like to ask more broadly, and then maybe we'll talk about some of the founders you've been helping. Yeah. Um, the, the, actually the thing that's interested me with car shares, especially is that how many of the, and I think mini does operate one somewhere as well. There's, so there are minis as, as part of the um, Drive Now yeah, and okay. Reach Now fleet. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it, it seems on the out, from the out, from to an outsider sometimes a bit counterintuitive. It's like, surely you want to sell more cars. Why would you encourage people to share them? Mm. So, I mean, maybe the easiest way to address this is just purely from a finance perspective. Like, how do you, is the, is the subscription fees enough to make up for that? I think that's part of the hypothesis. Yeah. Um, you know, so our our board member um, 
who's in charge of both mini and, and digital mobility at BMW is a uh, guy named Peter Schwarzenbauer. And he, he tells a story about how, you know, back in the, in the fifties, when you would buy a car, you would show up to a dealership with a suitcase full of cash. Right. Um, and then that changed over time and you had kind of the advent of, of things like lease yeah. financing, yeah. right. Where people would essentially pay for access. And I think if you think about the evolution of that and yeah, kind of for paying sure. for yeah. either time yeah. or TV. mileage or what have you, <laughs> no, yeah. um, yeah. I, I think it opens up the idea of, of, you know, quote unquote ownership yeah. and access, um, to an entirely broader range of people who may never have been able to have that experience, that premium experience of, um, you know, of, of, of being in a, in a mini or a, or a BMW or what have you. So like that idea of like mobility as a service mm. and different subscription packages is I think something that you're starting to see a lot of the OEMs experiment yeah, I've heard with. this in the U.S. is happening yeah. a lot at the moment. But I think it's a reflection. I mean, I, I think that the idea of car share, so like a free-floating car share like reach, like Drive Now or Reach Now, <laughs> is a reflection of the idea that there are a lot of people like yourself who don't need to own a car. But there are times where you might want to go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you're going to Ikea yeah. or you want to get out of, of town yeah. Yeah. Uh, or or what have you. And I, and so um, I think there are benefits for that for cities. Like I've heard that every shared vehicle takes somewhere between 9 to 13 mm-hmm. vehicles off the road. Um so I think there's a conversation there with like local governments about how they treat that, how they treat on street parking, mm-hmm. you know, around, around those kinds yeah, of things. Actually, uh, the one time I had a friend borrow one of the, the, might have been one of the competitors, but anyway, to, to move something to a rubbish tip for me. And we discovered they get priority parking and there was a queue going into the tip. We were able just to pull into any car park space next to the queue and just yeah. get the stuff in. So it's like, actually, we were benefiting from yeah. using our own car. I mean, is- I, <laughs> I am fascinated by that. Like, how do you incentivize that yeah. kind of behavior? And I think, it'll again, it'll be particularly true around electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. And then I think there's a big open question around, like, how do you treat autonomous vehicles as well? Yeah, and this is actually, I mean, for me as a non-driver because I'm not legally allowed to I mean I can but not legally allowed to yeah um this is a future that I unfortunately don't think will happen in my lifetime, but possibly in the next generation of not needing a license to to get behind the wheel. <laughs> it may not be a wheel anymore of a car and have access to private vehicles without using a taxi or something like that. And of course, the flip side of this in cities, I've heard a lot of criticism of Lyft and Uber and these services saying that it's actually increased traffic for the first mm-hmm. time in a long time in yep. a lot of cities. Yeah. Um, especially in cities that had bad, bad public transport in the first place because yeah. that's why people were taking them and of course that's made the public transport worse <laughs> so, so the replacing them with a kind of better managed because they're usually in partnership with the city of shared cars is, and they're multi-purposed you know uh, actually, it's hard to do the the numbers. I suppose on, a, on an Uber, for example, that is one car with one driver but multiple passengers versus one car with multiple drivers. I'm not sure. I don't know if there's anyone has done any numbers on that kind of right. thing. Right. But right. But also, share cars when they're not doing anything don't sit there idle. They sat there off. That's yeah. The, another difference, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. So R- Robin Chase, uh, who's one of the. Um, the co-founders of, of Zipcar mm. um, has done some really great work on okay. this, and, and she refers to this as, as kind of the, the hell of a potential hell mm. of autonomous vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, the idea of kind of you know ghost cars with no passengers yeah. just clogging yeah. the streets yeah. is, yeah. is yeah. awful. I think we yeah. you know we view um, the future as, as one where um, you know there's a, a strong kind of multimodal network which mm. includes you know, very pedestrian and, and walkable cities, but also really great mass transit mm. and opportunities for people to bike mm. and then also opportunities. And, but also the connections like the dockless bikes that have appeared here, which took a little while to get adopted, but they're actually great for the two to two, five, ten minute ride from your nearest station yeah. to home. I have a pretty decent bike, which I've kind of stopped using now because it was a liability because I always had to think about where to put it. Right. And if I couldn't be bothered riding after a few drinks, then... 
um, I've stuck with it. Sure. Whereas the dockless ones, they're not the best bikes, yeah. but they're super convenient. But it's a question of how does the government then, how does the municipal government regulate it so that it doesn't become a public nuisance? And they are becoming in some cities. Some haven't. They, I'm not sure if they even were regulated. It felt like a lot of companies just swept in dump bikes on the streets and went away again. And the government kind of went, hang on, what the hell is can I, um Can I share you with you just a, a quick... Um, uh, fact, which I which completely blew my mind. So when sure. I was in Shanghai, yeah, yeah so yeah. for the first six months, six the January to June of 2017, the city of Shanghai seized 150,000 bikes mm. from um, stairwells and entrances yeah. to subways, etc. Um, impounded 150,000 bikes, which represented 10 percent of the city's total. 10 percent of the city's total. I mean, 150,000, like. 30? I think it's like 24 million people. Yeah, yeah. Right? So 1.5 million bikes there. Yeah. Now, yeah. in the city of New York, you know how many uh, bikes there are in our bike share network currently? Uh, if it's anything like Australian cities, it's probably like 5,000. 10,000. 10,000. <laughs> Pretty close. Yeah. And it's but I mean, a, you think about the scale yeah. of that. It's just, it's wild. Yeah. But again, there's something to be said for like the quality of life of not having um, abandoned bikes. Yeah. That are that are choking yeah. city streets, and it was especially a problem in uh, Melbourne. They they end up a lot of them were vandalised and stuff because I don't know, just more of a cultural thing. Here they've been a bit of a weird reaction, and yeah. now people are starting to use them. But Berlin already had like three doctor bike schemes, right? Which I think have seen their day now, unfortunately, and then they've got to do something with all that, right? So, right. But um, but it is it's that, yeah. that it's that cultural point and like really understanding yeah. how people are going to respond to that, yeah. how they think. There's a lot of bike it. theft in Berlin, so it actually reduces that as well because people are like, well, I don't have to keep buying a new mm. bike every six months because mm-hmm. <laughs> it got stolen, right? So all you need is get crap bike, but lots of people buy right. secondhand crap bikes, which are not any good to ride. But yeah. Yeah. um. So, what are some of the the founders you've you've helped, and what are they doing, and, and where? I suppose things yeah. are very global. Um, so, I'll give you maybe um, just uh, maybe three examples. Mm-hmm. Um, so one in the urban ag space, mm-hmm. um, which we're really excited about. Agriculture. Ag- urban agriculture, yeah. yeah. Um, so like the city of New York only has um, two days of hand, two days of food on hand at any given time, which is a crazy thought. Really? But um, we think that there's a, a really good opportunity around um, modular uh, mechanisms for growing really fresh food, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of food deserts, etc. So we backed a company called Farm Shelf, which is using science and technology. Is this technology. a partnership with Dell? No, I don't. I don't believe they're okay. working with Dell. I mean, I saw one in I think in New York that was something to do with Dell. So I'm sure yeah. they um, they are um, they're working with a number of um, restaurants and hotels mm-hmm. and corporate cafeterias okay. now to basically scale their their system. And it looks something similar yeah. to this yeah. um, small vending machine, except it's actually beautiful. So it makes the food attractive, and they're growing microgreens. Oh, that bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we talked about Luna Wave. I'll, I'll tell you a story about a really interesting um, company that we found in Spain mm-hmm. uh, called Swiftera. Okay. Um, so Swiftera, um, actually, uh, the founders came out of the European Space Agency. Okay. Uh, and they, they saw a problem around um, uh, low Earth orbit satellites, which are yeah. still very, very expensive. Uh, so they're actually using um, some balloon technology mm-hmm. for real-time urban imagery. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and we help them uh, to develop their product and understand um, their go to market and uh, they 're now actually back here in in Spain, um, but doing some really interesting work. The company's closed a couple of million dollars in funding um, and again built, built this ultra low cost device uh, that um, will stay above a certain area for um, a given amount of time and then provide that insight back to the ground much much cheaper and I guess it's for mapping and things like for ultra this car and stuff like that too yeah yeah there's yeah. a whole lot of whole lot yeah. of future use cases um, and then I'll tell you another company that I'm really excited about that's in the current cohort uh, it's a startup called rent logic mm-hmm. so the um, problem that they're trying to solve is that um, when you move into a new flat mm-hmm. it's very difficult to understand what the history of that building actually is whether it's yeah, had any yeah. fire code violations yeah. whether there have been mold issues yeah. or bed bugs or what have you um, and so they're providing um, a standard much like I don't know if you've seen um, in New York now, 
all the restaurants have grades before yeah, you yeah, kind of yeah, walk yeah, in. Yeah. yeah, it's it's fairly common in Europe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so they're providing a similar standard for buildings. Um, and what's really interesting about them as well is that uh, they've had their algorithm audited. So I think there's this big question. There's you know a lot of conversation here, mm-hmm. but a lot of conversation generally about AI. The question is like, how is your algorithm built? Mm-hmm. Um, so they've gone through this really interesting process, and I'll send you the the, the piece oh. on. Um, I'd be interested to know who audits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that company is also getting a lot of traction. Yeah. And again, the value proposition is not just for the renter, yeah, but it's yeah. also for the landlord because yeah. it gives the landlord a way to, to be, differentiate the portfolio. That could be one of those very dangerous ones, especially in a city like New York, where the word intention meaning ends up getting used against renters and like, oh, well, I've got a higher rating, so I'm going to put the rent up kind of thing. We'll see. <laughs> it's always an unfortunate one. And I think this happens a lot to founders who are well-meaning like Airbnb I think is a classic example I don't think the founders of Airbnb ever intended to become this like target of anti-gentrification and stuff yeah I'm pretty sure they just wanted people to rent out spare rooms sure <laughs> well, the int- I think I do think that there's an interesting implication which again the company has now um, begun to explore around lenders mm. and and so it's the financial institutions who are lending to real estate yeah. owners with a portfolio and again there's not a whole lot of transparency um, uh or level setting around like how the buildings actually operate. Mm. It's actually like uh, my wife and I used to run a, a not for profit in, in Melbourne aimed at renters and Vic, state of Victoria doesn't have any minimal standards for renters. Interesting. Which, well, I have to introduce you to rent lodging. Yeah, right which we haven't, we don't, we haven't done much. We haven't done this for years, but we, it was something we did a lot of back there. Um, so, you know, the aspect of adding on extra value was so hard because like literally the land could do what they liked if they wanted to. And it was your impetus to take them to court yeah. if you wanted to. And who does in a tight sure. market? Melbourne and Sydney are very tight markets. They're as bad as San Francisco. Um, well, they were. But, and, 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 you know, I think everyone has somewhat acknowledged that the future of many cities will be renting. Um, and in Europe especially that's kind of more established and I think America UK Australia need to acknowledge this a bit more but also make it more more acceptable as a societal thing like oh poor you you have to rent Mm. is one side of it but also this aspect of being harsher on landlords who take advantage of that which is a (laughs) which is a harder one because supply and demand always right creates bad dynamics if someone is willing to be taken advantage of because they have no choice then it's going to happen no matter how much regulation you have but if you can have these sorts of like you know the the platforms that instead kind of look at it from the other perspective yeah of um making the 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 operator want to be seen in a good light sure i mean this is the whole we think data one of the great parts of data is that it, it helps with transparency yeah, yeah right yeah, and i yeah. think you're you're absolutely right like this is a big we see this question around housing and affordable housing um as one that not only cities like new york and san francisco struggle with right but it, it truly is it's, mm. it's a, this is a global issue mm. um so yeah, that you know that transparency and and the use of good data and good algorithms, I think, yeah. is is a critical tool. So in conclusion, I, I usually like to ask people like their vision for the next six months, but I think with mm-hmm. you it might be I need, might need to look a little bit longer. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, and there's actually I think there's a talk happening now that you probably wanted to go to, so I do apologise for Not the, at all. about the. I think it was like what was it? Let's check because it was a very comp. I I think I know which one yeah. you're referencing here because he's like the. Uh, no more cities by 2050, yeah. which I'm not 100 sure about. I, I think it's the opposite of that. But I agree. What what would um, I guess? What would your ideal <laughs> ideal, bearing in mind that neither of us are probably going to be alive when it happens? Wait, 2050? No, no. I mean, oh, okay. Well, maybe. <laughs> well, actually. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm hope. I'm let's yeah. hope. Right. 2050 seems like a long way away. That's to start taking, 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 <laughs> to start taking better care right, of ourselves. Let's say 2050. <laughs> yeah, let's say 2050. Yeah, let's what. What's your like ideal vision of what cities will look like by 2050, with a dose of realism as well, I guess. Okay. Well, I guess um, maybe I can just pontificate yeah. uh, on what I hope they'll look like. Sure, sure. Right? Course, yeah. uh, or what I hope they don't look like. Yeah, that, that's probably an easier one. Right, okay. <laughs> um, so, like, I hope that there are not drones flying everywhere in my city. Hmm. 
um, I hope that there are good that there's good mass transit mm-hmm. and and cities are walkable. Um, and I and I hope that um, government is more responsive in terms of legislation um, to improve quality of life and um, and and, uh, and and the needs of its citizens. Um, I hope that they're not single platform like single technology yeah. platforms yeah, in okay. cities. Yeah. I think um, some of the beauty of of places like. Um, New York or Berlin is they are somewhat chaotic yeah. and they're not governed by one single all knowing very well, which garden is entity. A bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, I, I, I do hope that, um, they continue to be hubs for entrepreneurship mm-hmm. and, and opportunity and encouraging of a diversity of, um, of opinions, uh, and that they're, um, that they are, um, diverse. I mean, I was saying like Berlin kind of reminds me of New York a little bit, um, in like the late eighties and nineties in that it's gritty. Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. a bit too much so, but yeah. right, right. Yeah. But I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I kind of prefer that to the overly sanitized, um, you know, corporate advertising uh, city that I think a lot of places have begun to look yeah. like. And there was a very damning article about New York in some publication last week. I I'm think not surprised. It was exceptionally long about the. <laughs> downward slope of the city again yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't live there so yeah. I couldn't really comment but yeah I mean I think we need I think we need more dense housing yeah definitely in, in most cities yeah. um, I'm hoping that um, you know that, that, that the utilities in particular will be at the table in terms of um, you know more electric vehicle mm. uh, charging infrastructure I think mm-hmm. that is that's where we need to go I think there needs to be private sector investments in resilience because I think most cities again are going to deal with climate mm-hmm. um, issues and, and and also I think resilience like one interesting aspect that come I've seen recurring recently was when we talk about entrepreneurs, we often unfortunately are talking about reasonably well educated, well off majority at the moment, white people yeah. who had privilege already. And there's a lot of entrepreneurialism happening in other parts of our cities that sometimes <laughs> gets a little bit not noticed. No, um, and that, that, I think that feeds into the resilience as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, again, I, I make this case all the time about New York, but like New York is a, is a city also that's built by immigrants. Yeah, for right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you're, you're an immigrant here in Berlin. Mm. Right. And I think like the idea of, you know, cities as hubs yeah. of um, creative exchange and, and um, welcoming to kind mm. of people from all different walks of life, I think, is really important, particularly in the U.S. now. Yeah. yeah. Especially um, this week. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, some shared value. And then also, like, you know, cultural creativity. I, I do like I was talking to someone last night told me that they were here in Berlin on an art visa. Yeah. I didn't even know that was a thing. It exists in a few countries, but they're reasonably easy to get here. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's yeah. so I think that's yeah. the place for beauty and art and um, design. And um, and I think that's you know, cities mm-hmm. for thousands of years have been defined by those kinds of contributions. And taking it directly back to, to sort of who you work for. Do you think there'll be more or less cars? Uh, I think that in the long term, there will be less cars because I think that they will generally, they will be on demand um, and you'll, you'll use them when you, Mm. when you need them. We could repurpose some roads, which would be kind of interesting in some cities as well. Yeah, Yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, again, thinking about you know, the evolution of, of multimodal, mm. um, is really, really interesting. And I think you are, you're already starting to see the growth of, um, of shared fleets mm-hmm. and ride hail. I, I, I will say like, I think that there is a lot of disruption on the horizon around automation, yeah. right? A lot of good middle-class jobs for people who drive buses just as a, for example, yeah. um, you yeah. know, the same can be true for, you know, for, for the, for taxi drivers. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic when you look back at history that, it will resolve itself in the long run, but we don't know. It just doesn't seem like uh, f- that local electeds um, have a real handle on no. the issue. No. And I, and I do, th- and you know, I'll tell you, like, I, I think it, I think it will probably be here sooner than yeah. most oh, people. Oh, definitely. Have. I think Maybe not as soon as like Silicon Valley says, <laughs> but I mean, seriously, like uh, look at yeah. Waymo is already running driverless fleets in Phoenix, Arizona and just put an order in for 80,000 vehicles. Wow. Okay. So 
I mean, I think it's, it's going to happen relatively soon again, not tomorrow, mm. but certainly like within the next 10 years. And I this think is hope by 2050 that we've ironed out the problems. <laughs> yeah. I don't know there if we have, have that positive. long. I, I'm not sure if we have that long. I think it, it'll also probably happen in, in trucking. Uh, yeah, well, definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Before well, definitely before. even here, the like here is big on logistics. So yeah. trucks are almost first. Right. I know Daimler and companies like that here are working on autonomous, autonomous trucks already mm-hmm. and they've been testing them in Bavaria and stuff right. already. already. Right. Yeah. So and that's really a country that's somewhat see. opposed to all that. Absolutely. And has incredibly <laughs> strong labor laws. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So it'll be yeah. really interesting to see what the reaction is. So my name is Rachel Ginsberg. Um, I'm based in New York and I'm a creative strategist and experience designer. Um, and I was at TOA talking about a strategy for emergent storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, uh, the idea behind it is to kind of increase our competence in envisioning through getting together and telling stories to kind of expand our perspective on what's possible in the world. Um, and I was speaking specifically about uh, an immersive theater project that my colleagues and I uh put forth and launched at Sundance this past January. Um, It's actually called Frankenstein AI. um, And it's actually the immersive theater installation that we created was kind of the launch of what we're intending to be a much larger design research project that will take place over the next number of years. Um, I mean, essentially, the goal of it is actually to create kind of a, a creative system for thinking about artificial intelligence in the future. Um, and that will involve a number of different kinds of interventions. But the goal is to bring people together and tell stories, to create a corpus of emotional data. A corpus is a text-based data set um, in the hopes of doing research sort of in that area of crowdsourced AI to kind of combat um, specifically human bias and algorithms. And I'm guessing the choice of the word Frankenstein was somewhat specific uh, or intentional. It, it's actually, Absolutely. Uh, I've, um, surprised. I, I've done a talk with elements of this recently where I've included mention of Frankenstein and I actually think the story is somewhat forgotten about by a younger generation especially and that's what it means yeah <laughs> absolutely absolutely so yeah Frankenstein is very intentional um, for a couple of different reasons one um I mean, that narrative in particular was kind of the dawn of science fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, It's actually 200 years old this year. Oh, really? Uh, It's the 200th anniversary of its (laughs) foundation. It was written by a young woman. Mary Shelley was actually 19 when she wrote it. Um, And uh, it really was the first story of its kind to... I mean, at least to the extent that we're aware of now, to kind of ask questions about what the implications are of humans creating something that is able to escape our control, Mm -hmm. um, which is an anxiety that goes back a long way. I mean, the Pandora myth Mm -hmm. from ancient Greece is the same thing. Is the Jewish Golem myth, is that also about control? I'm not sure. Um, Golems are, it's a little different. Golems are actually, uh, they're... um, they protect communities. Call him as a protector. Um, but Frankenstein is a is a particularly kind of rich narrative when thinking about the anxieties around emerging technology, in particular artificial intelligence, because the fear of us creating something that we can't control that could hurt us is very much what Frankenstein's about. It is actually interesting because Frankenstein obviously is long before we had any concept of computer programming really. Um, the artificial intelligence is, well, it's not really spoken about, but I guess it's an amalgamation of whatever brains were in the original body. And I think from memory, it sort of implied that maybe the brain came from a <laughs> it's a British story, so lower classes or someone like that. <laughs> so, but you know, I guess it feeds into the current issue of you know, AI is what you what you feed it. Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. And then that's what you mentioned, and then this has come up in a lot of conferences recently, especially this year around. It's not actually the AI is the issue; it's the training of the AI. Yeah, issue. absolutely. No, yeah. that's exactly yeah. it. That's exactly it. It's that. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of, I mean, there, well, I have so many things that I want to say about everything you just said. I think one is that um, a lot of the anxiety, uh, broadly speaking, about artificial intelligence 
um, especially the stuff that you know Hollywood tends to play with in terms of dystopic futures like Skynet in term, from Terminator. Um, that's really an, an artificial general intelligence, right? Yeah. So, and that's still sort of a mythical creature. Like we don't actually know if AGI is possible. Um, we sort of think it is, but mm-hmm. it hasn't actually happened. Um, the concerns now and the dystopic reality that we're starting to face now is a lot more to do with misuse of narrow intelligence, yeah. um, and which is exactly what we're talking about. And I think that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I think that. Yeah, so the, it's interesting, actually, because there isn't any mention of the origin of the bodies or the body parts in the, in the book. Um, in the film, actually, there's some sort of references to the idea that it might be a killer or that it was criminals yeah. where Igor was getting the bodies. Well, but actually, Frankenstein's monster is mostly... <laughs> Fairly pleasant until put under pressure. Well, that's that's actually that that point is exactly yeah. the point that um, that we wanted to make because our source material for the project was the book, not the film, mm. and. Thing is that the book, actually, the making of Frankenstein, Fra- Frankenstein's monster, excuse me, is actually not really so like deeply addressed in the novel. Um, what the novel's really about is what happens after the creature comes alive and is abandoned by its creator, that's who, who is repulsed by it and who doesn't take responsibility for having created this life. And so the anxiety that we're interested in interrogating about Frankenstein and the anxiety that it brings up is the idea that it's a fait accompli, that it becomes something dangerous, when in fact we as human beings have the agency to prevent that from happening and that we are in this space, and this is sort of how it ties back into emergent storytelling as a practice that, you know, it's really the storytellers and the envisioners who control the future because we can't manifest what we can't see. And if the rest of us don't get some skin in the game in envisioning futures that we want to see, there's no way that we can manifest them. And we'll have our own monsters that are against us. Exactly. Exactly. Because we just abdicated. Because we just abdicated the future to other people and to other people who have whatever agendas they have. And that's fine. I mean, anybody can have whatever agenda they want. But personally, I don't think that it's acceptable for me and for the people who I care about to just sort of relinquish all control over what the future of the earth and the human race is going to look like, you know. And so in the, uh, the, the Project Frankenstein, uh, what, what's, what's the, you said you referred to the source of curious control, what is the, uh, what is the project, what was it, what is it? So the installation at, uh, at Sundance was an AI-powered immersive theater, um, two-act installation. And the way that it worked was that there were <laughs> there were uh, a few different points during the installation when we collected data from the people who were participating. And that data would be transmitted through an API to a machine learning algorithm that we developed, that we trained on the, uh, the text of Frankenstein, and that was continuously training throughout the course of the, the festival. Just the text of Frankenstein. Yeah, well, and an amplified version of the text of Frankenstein because the text is actually big enough to, to account for a, a large enough data set. So um, the engineer who we were working with actually, we, we did a sentiment analysis on the text based on three different axes, um, positive, negative, uh, focus, which focus meaning inward or outward. So am I talking about myself or am I talking about you? And energy level. So is it low or is it high? And points in between. Um, and this is sort of specific. Uh, so this is the actual pieces of text, the fragments being sentiment analyzed. And so the way that we amplified um, the body of text was we basically sentiment analyzed the actual text of the piece and then amplified it based on the sentiment that it found using a generative chatbot. That was the training data set that was baseline. And then over the course of the festival as we were gathering inputs from people, what was happening was that those inputs were being sentiment analyzed along that same system. What were those inputs? Those inputs were, the first input was a form that people filled out that were talking about their memories, emotions, fears, and hopes related to questions about what it means to be human. 
the second input was um, a kind of emotional mapping exercise that happened after people had conversations with a partner who is in most cases a stranger about experiences of connection and isolation. We weren't actually recording those conversations, but after the conversation was over, we had designed a game, a multi-touch game that we put into a, it was a, in a Microsoft Surface Studio that was set into the tables where they were sitting, and they played a game that had an interaction kind of like a Ouija board, where they identified the emotions that they were feeling during the course of that conversation. And then um, the second the second step was to attach a body part to each specific emotion. So we had a screen with, yeah, it was actually less gross than it sounds like. No, I'll just think of it Frank as possible. Well, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, no, that, that's exactly, that, that was exactly the reference. Yeah. Um, and the body parts were um, the eye and the heart and the guts and the brain. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. And the idea was, and there was a couple others that are on my hand, um, and the idea was, uh, without too much um, prepping, to really get people, like, if they felt vulnerability, where did they feel that vulnerability? Was it like a heart? Was it something you felt in your heart? Was it something you felt in your stomach or in your brain or in your eyes? Um, and, and that created a value that went also to the API. And then finally, the last input was in Act 2, which was uh, a conversation actually between people and the AI itself that we had built a set piece to embody. Um, I don't know if you've seen the video, but I can send you a link to a video that we made. Um, and there was a Q&A with the AI, but instead of uh, people asking the AI questions and the AI being the kind of all-knowing oracle that it typically is in the world that we live in, you know, with Siri and Alexa, what we did was we actually flipped that around yeah, yeah, yeah. and had the AI asking people questions about what it means to be human. And those questions changed. Different yeah, the AI was generating the questions. And then as as, it, um, as people responded, there was a, a docent, like an actor in costume in the room who was facilitating the conversation, and that person was entering the answers into a computer terminal that were also going to the AI. And what was happening with all of that was, um, so the sentiment analysis, actually based on the values that were returned on each different characteristic, would generate one of 12 emotional states that we had predetermined based on the values, and then our creation creative team had pulled a bunch of um, source material from the internet to create sonic environments and visuals that were attached to each emotional state. So as people were responding to the AI's questions, the AI was parsing uh, their responses for emotions and then reflecting back those emotions with visual stimulus and also a sound. So the premise actually in this case was was basically like that, that the AI was learning from people what it meant to be human and kind of mimicking them and mimicking their responses emotionally. And has it has it uh, continued to to live? <laughs> it has, yeah. I mean, we've been adjusting it yeah. uh, and we're sort of exploring new ways to use it. Um, what we built for Sundance was really incredible and visually striking, but very, very complicated and expensive. And it's, we don't want to be limited in our ability to install it in the future. So what we're exploring now is a series of workshops where the AI will actually be a collaborator mm -hmm. with people speculating on the future of various kinds of complex polarizing issues. So we just prototyped a workshop in Munich, actually, where we were talking about immigration and had the AI. Um, we were using the AI as a creative collaborator and speculating on the future of immigration. And did your Frankenstein turn on you? Or... <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. But interestingly, over the course of Sundance, um, what we found actually was was that the AI uh, went from being very angry all the time to feeling a lot more connected after it had been interacting with me. Exactly. Well, and I mean, you know, it was engineered somewhat in a way. I mean, uh, not engineered in the sense that we were engineering the data, but the experience was engineered to inspire people to feel more connected to each other. So, in a way, it's an expected outcome that the AI responded with feeling more connected because the people who were engaging with each other were actually connecting, and that's what they were feeding it. Do you, do you think this could be like a, a lesson for the future? Or training, you know, kind of. Um, I don't mean this in any demeaning way, but like real world AIs that are yeah. causing public public service in who knows what in the future. Yeah. I mean, instead of just training them on 
source data, they should actually also be like literally put in a room with either their intended um, users for a period of time to actually, yeah, <laughs> with people. Yeah. Because you need a training data in itself that many yeah. engineers especially forget about. They just think, oh, we just need all this information. Yeah. Not the actual kind of user training. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that what you just suggested is absolutely one way that this work could influence that. I do definitely think that we need to do a lot more exploring on how to create context for artificial intelligence. Because the thing is that we forget, you know, we 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 as human beings forget that we're looking through our own eyes all the time. You know, it's very hard to take a step away from ourselves to assess our own bias in the world because we can only see through it. Um, it's one of the reasons why diversity is so important. Yeah. Um, Especially yeah. in, um, in AI, of course. Um, it's, it's something that I've thought about, that if, if the biases we currently have continue and are sort of somewhat more automated and are used to make decisions, then, yeah, we need to sort of solve the diversity issue before it, not before it's too late, but... I mean, I also don't want to speak about it being too late, but the truth is that there is some reality to that. Yeah, for sure. And I think yeah. that, yeah, I think that, you know, the idea that, like, I think that... The point of this is not that we have the answers in terms of data science research. In fact, we're, we're now exploring various different organizations that we can partner with to really be working much more assertively with data scientists in terms of structuring publishable research. We're, we're, we're still sort of making that transition. But I think that what is really important is recognizing that experimentation uh, for other reasons besides transactional data. Yeah. And transactions of every kind, not just financial transactions, but, you know, or, or e-commerce, but actually, like, you know, uh, these sort of binary things where, like, sentencing data or, um, or decision support or um, diagnostics. Like, a lot of the tools that are being, that, that are um, being developed with AI tend to be really focused on is it this or is it that. Yeah. And there isn't as much kind of nuance. And I think that, you know, the opportunity for artists and for creators and creative types. Like psychologists as well, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. To be experimenting with artificial intelligence and to really be stepping into the conversation about it yeah. and sharing our point of view and sharing the point of view of the humanities and the social sciences is super it's important. It's like if we just trained uh, customer service people to just regurgitate facts. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's the same thing we're doing with customer service chatbots. It's like, exactly. Maybe we're happy with those sorts of interactions now. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, anyway. I don't know if we are. When the gray area between the artificial intelligence and the um, people becomes less clear, and there's a lot of speculation and a lot of conversation around the fact that we should make service environments a bit clear what you're speaking to, but that hasn't actually happened yet. That's just um, being talked about, especially in Europe. But, because it'd been time when I've spoken to customer service people, I'm like, I'm speaking to a machine. Yeah, it kind of <laughs> is. Well, it's also because, like, how much, I mean, how much agency do those people really have to actually I act know. on their own behalf? I mean, I actually worked in retail for a long time. Yeah, but empathetic with you. Yeah, I worked in retail for a long time, and there's something, I mean, it's funny, like, I loved the people. I hated the management. The management was a nightmare. Yeah. But I loved the people. I mean, it's interesting because America is sometimes renowned for having good customer service, but it's mostly because it's tip based and it's just incentivized to be good. Whereas countries like here where there is no tipping, customer service can be very. Well, if you meet someone who actually wants to do a good job, then you get. But they don't have to, there's no motivation. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so no, totally. And I think the thing, too, that's interesting about American service culture is that there's two. One, there are organizations that because they're tip-based, right, but but as a result of that, what has also happened is that there's a lot of really, really incredible values-based businesses that have arisen around service, mm -hmm. um, in particular in the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really interesting thought leadership around yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the value of it is creating a culture of comfort and making people feel cared for. Um, and that's something that I think that, you know, one of the things that I mourn a lot about um, e-commerce is that we really lose the capacity to make people feel cared for. And the interpretations in technology, the way that we interpret making people feel taken care of in technology are woefully short. Um, the way that we've done that largely is by personalizing, but personalizing 
something based on our perception of what people want. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, to your point earlier, I think the opportunity to bring uh, different kinds of thinkers into contact with things like artificial intelligence can also help us to reassess how we consider, like what we consider to be good, because we feed data to the AI, but we also tell it what we think is good, what we think is a good result, so that it can then you know, spiral off into its unsupervised environment and continue assessing what's good. But not everybody has the same definition of what's good. And so if we can expand the definition of what's good to recognize that there are so many more value systems than just the value systems that are being built around the specific technologies, I think that we have a much better chance of building much more empathetic technology if we can be more empathetic. And that was my interviews from Tech Open Air here in Berlin with Mika Koch and Rachel Ginsberg. If you enjoyed the show, please go to gregarismammal.com slash podcast for previous episodes. Well, on the same website slash support to donate to the show or buy merchandise for the show. And you can also find us on Facebook if you search for Gregarious Mammal. Rate us wherever you listen to us. Share the show. Always appreciated. And if you want to speak to me personally, you can find me at Chris Chinch on Twitter or ChrisChinchilla.com. And until next time, thanks for listening. Yeah.